Okay, students, let's uh, begin lecture. Students, uh, we have uh, SI sessions on Mondays, and let me encourage you again right now to uh, participate in SI. If you can make one of those sessions on Monday, uh, great. If you, can, if you can only go on Wednesdays, that'll probably be good too. If you can only go for half an hour twice a week, you know, that'll, that'll probably be helpful. Uh, and what we usually do is uh, we analyze exam scores, which I have to send those over to SARC uh, this week. As soon as we have all the scores done. And uh, what we usually find is that students that go to uh, SI on a consistent basis usually do a letter grade higher than the students that don't on average. So it's, it's pretty good to go to. Uh, office hours tomorrow, 11 a.m. to uh, 1 p.m. And uh, I want to talk about some stuff here um, to, to kind of review from last week about energy levels in Earth's gravitational field. So if you look at this picture of these wrestlers, that is the coolest shot, that one guy. I mean, he looks like he's totally calm, but those other guys are probably thinking they're about to get blazed up by this guy. That's what you call a flying body slam. But we're going to do some energy level work here today before we get uh, into Chapter 5. One thing I want to uh, emphasize to you, oh, by the way, before we start with this, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that the clicker base that I've been using for the last five years or something is dead. It died in previous class, and so we, we have a clicker question, but we won't, we won't be clicking today. But you'll still be able to think about it and, and uh, make notes about it. So that's the bad news. The good news is that we have some, a lot of homework tonight. I know that cheers everybody up, so yeah, we'll be doing that. And it'll be involving energy, and I'll talk about it in the next few minutes. Um, something I did not go over with you last Thursday that I ought to have done is uh, just the metric unit of work, the joule. It's defined as 1.0 kilogram meter squared per second squared. Uh, and if you, for instance, look at the GPE formula minus MGY, uh, the energy of position in the, uh, associated with the Y coordinate, you can see that the units of MGY work out to kilogram meters squared per second squared. So here's a kilogram. And in the numerator of G is meters. And then in the numerator or the unit Y, it's also meters. So the numerator's got meters times meters. That's meters squared. And then down here in the denominator of G is second squared. So, so yeah, this works out to kilogram meter squared per second squared. In this particular example here, and I just put in 1.00 for everything except for G, uh, you get 9.8 jowls. The symbol is capital J for joules. And, uh, but you can also always break it down into kilogram meters squared per second squared. And we're going to do an example of that in a few minutes. And sometimes it's useful to break it down into basic units, kilogram meters squared per second squared. When you're working on a calculation, you want to do some cancellations. Another one, example of how the joule works out to kilogram meter squared per second squared uh, is this one, the kinetic energy formula, one-half mb squared. Um, so one-half, that's a 0 0.5, and a couple 1.00s, 
So 1.00 kilogram, 1.00 meter per second. But the speed, 1.00 meter per second, is quantity squared. Now, 1 squared is equal to 1, so that's easy. But meters per second quantity squared works out to the uh, meter squared in the numerator here on the last line and second squared in the denominator. And, of course, the kilogram comes from the mass factor, m. And in this particular example, a one kilogram object moving at one meter per second, kinetic energy, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 joules. Another thing that I'd like to reemphasize with you uh, is that the joule is also the same as a newton meter, and the work formula helps you to see that clearly. The work formula is uh, F delta X, so a force in newtons times some distance in meters. So uh, 1.00 newton and 1.00 meter, just to give some nice round easy numbers, uh, gives you 1.00 newton meters, and that's the same as a joule. So my admonition to you, or my instruction, is, uh, excuse me, I was about to burp into the microphone. But I'm drinking a monster up here, but so that always makes me burp. i got to be careful. Anyway, my admonition to you is um, when you're working with energies, be alert to using, you know, if you're working on a calculation, be alert to using kilogram meters squared per second squared or newton meters or just joules interchangeably. Wherever you see one, you can write the other one in. Because sometimes it, it is helpful for canceling. So if you're after a speed, you might want to keep it in kilogram meters squared per second squared. But if you're after a frictional force, you might want to just keep it in newton meters and then cancel meters. So we'll do an example of that in just a minute. Now, as for your homework tonight, some of your homework, um, I want to go over um, another thing about... Uh, potential energy and kinetic energy and we're going to use this example so make a note uh, go ahead and draw a sketch um, and, and what I've done is basically a couple um, altitude levels here from 10 meters all the way down to 0 meters every 2 meters so y equals 10 meters y equals 8 meters y equals 6 meters and we're going to say that in our example a free fall that we're going to consider a, a two liter bottle uh, so four of these babies uh, filled with Mountain Dew uh, at 10 meters up now 10 meters is a little bit taller than this room so 10 meters way up there or two kilograms of Mountain Dew up there at 10 meters oh did I say 10 ki two kilograms yes a liter of water is a kilogram and soda pop is mostly water. I mean, it's a little bit of acid. You ever think about that? You, I, 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 I'm so thirsty, I think I'll have a soda pop. I'll have a cold Coca-Cola. You know? But really, all you're drinking is water, sugar, and acid. I mean, look at, look at the ingredients. The acid, that's where the fizz comes from. It's pretty, it's pretty disastrous, if you ask me. I hardly ever drink soda. Anyway, so a soda, a, a two liter unit of soda pop is basically two kilograms. So write down M equals two kilograms for this one. And since you're holding it at rest up there at 10 meters, the kinetic energy is zero. Now what we want to do is figure out the potential energy up there at 10 meters. And so, do not turn your clickers on, but do jot down this question. This is the first clicker question we were going to do. 
What is the GPE of a two kilogram bottle of Mountain Dew at elevation Y equals 10.0 meters? Go ahead and calculate that. And actually, it's an easy one. You can, if you know your formula, you can calculate that in your head. Are those mocha monsters any good, Caroline? Have you ever had one of those? The mocha ones? You don't drink monsters? I saw one in the machine out there. Well, somebody must like it. All right, raise your hand if you have an answer. You ready? To? Okay, let me... Um, let me see a show of hands if you have option A, 98.0 joules. Raise your hand. Oh. Raise your hand if you have 196. Ooh. That's quite a few of you. Uh, all right. But who, but who actually had 49? Nobody? Bueller? Anyone? Gosh. 88.5. Nobody? Gosh. You guys are geniuses today. There it is. 196. Go ahead and jot that down. Or just put it in your diagram. And here's the interesting thing, and this is really what I want to emphasize. And that is um, the total energy, the total of these two kinds of energies, one's the energy of motion, one's the energy of position, uh, they always add up to the same number. And that number we call the total mechanical energy. And the symbol for it is just capital E. So it's not GPE or KE, it's just capital E. Total mechanical energy, and theoretically, that is the same number. Because when you lose some kinetic energy, you gain some potential. When you lose some potential energy on the way down, you gain kinetic. You speed up. And they, theoretically, if you discount air, frick, you know, dra air drag, or drag forces from air, air resistance, um, those two numbers just interchange. And they'll always add up to um, 196 in this example. So. For any level that you care to talk about, you can always calculate uh, the total mechanical energy. And therefore, I mean, if you have one, le if you know the data at one level, you know, like up here at, at 10 meters, if you know that, you can figure out any other level that you want from that. It's kind of like a crossword puzzle. You know, you figure out two words over here and three down words over here, and eventually you get everything in between. And it's the same thing with this. So, for instance, um, go down to y equals zero just before impact. All right. Now, just before impact, you've lost all your potential energy. And all your potential energy has gone into kinetic energy. So now, down here at this level, you want to jot down kinetic energy is 196 joules. And potential energy is zero joules. Okay, that's how nature works. The total mechanical energy is conserved, e equals 196. All right, now your homework tonight is going to be um, working a table, a tabular. Can you see a table from this? I mean, I'm going to make a table here in just a second. Can you see how this might? This data, this kind of exercise might work into a, to, into a table. All right, let's let's do a table. Here's the Mountain Dew table. All right, and we're going to work out an example of this. Theoretically, you know, you're going to have homework related to this, so take good notes on what we're just, what we're about to do. Um, theoretically, at, at, at any altitude you specify, you could figure out. 
kinetic potential and total mechanical energies. All right. Now, for this example, the, the Mountain Dew example, uh, it's 196 all the way down in the total mechanical energy column. So go ahead, 196, 196, 196, all the way down. And then we know down here at the bottom, this is another easy one here. But if I specify, I'll tell you what, if I, if I specify the mass and the speed um, at any one position, so if I tell you the speed at y equals 8 meters, you can figure out anything. You can figure out the entire table, any, any elevation that you want. And that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, Caroline, could you help me up here for a moment? What we're going to do is pause the YouTube, and I'm going to go to the document cam and work out. Can you put it uh, onto um, uh, document cam? All right, so we just tackled this table. Part Anyway, part of it. And the, the idea is you can nail down any level and kind of figure it out like a crossword puzzle almost. Uh, if you've got one row specified, and really even a middle row, one of the intermediate heights, you could figure it out from that. You know, go upwards and downwards instead of just going down from the top like we did. Your homework tonight, homework 7.1, is going to be practicing kinetic energy concepts in this table setting. Uh, but it's going to be with a basketball, so different, so not quite as cinchy as this example. All right, but still pretty, pretty basic. Just follow the same strategy, and the the document cam that we just did, I'll post that in web courses this afternoon, so you'll be able to refer to that and listen to me blabbing my big mouth, um, and then apply it to the basketball problems. All right. So let me pause for questions about any of this. I know it's only Tuesday, but is anybody in here up for maybe dismissing early today? You mean twice in one day? But you're only saying that because you have a fancy new lunchbox. <laughs> Anyways, I, 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 I do, you know, I admit it. It's not just this semester. It's true. I say, I think we're going to dismiss early today. And, you know, I run my mouth so much. It, it frequently, <laughs> hey, I'm the, I, I have to be humble about it, you know, right? But uh, I think we will. We did this in the, in the morning class. Anyways, let's get to chapter five concepts. And the other part of your homework tonight, you got a ton of homework, 7.1. And you may be saying to yourself, Dr. B, why is it 7.1? Why isn't it just eight? Well, it's homework that I, I was supposed to give you in homework seven, and I didn't. Uh, so you're going to have it now. But it's going to be good. I've, and plus, the homework 7.1 it's just this big practice set for tables, basically. And um, I'm going to give you until October 13th for it. And you're going to have six attempts. So just use it as a study tool to get ready for a midterm exam, uh, too. And you'll see it. it. For you guys, it's set to start at 120. Wait a minute. It's 1236. When do we get out of here? 120. 120? Oh my, hopefully earlier. Oh my goodness. This is a cool photo. This is one of the ones in our textbook. It's from the Paranal Observatory down in the Chilean Andes, way up in the 
dry air of the high altitude high altitude Andes. It's perfect place for observing the stars. The only the only place better is pretty much the moon. If we could get a, a moon base, you know, and and some uh, and some telescopes up on the moon, that would be really sweet. Anyways, one of the things about this particular observatory is, um, you know, these beautiful time exposures. Um, and you can see the tra those are called star trails. And uh, you, you get images like that at night if you s set your camera and just open the shutter. And this one's for a good hour or two. Um, and you'll see the light from the star will keep coming into the camera as the star moves across the arc that you see. Uh, but it's not the stars that are moving. The stars appear to be moving because the Earth is spinning. And so angular momentum is the idea behind the fact that the Earth is still spinning. You know, all the planets spin. They all have a, um, a, a rotational axis, a spin axis. Our spin axis, and you can make a note of this, it's, a little, it's not in the slides, but the spin axis of the Earth is pointing toward the North Star. Okay, that's one of the North, you know, that's... The North Star appears to always be in the same place. It's our, our guide star. And uh, the other planets in the solar system, all except uh, Uranus, I think, their spin axis points pretty close to the North Star. They have a different, you know, for them, they'd have a, maybe a different star. But they're all pretty close. The sun's rotation axis is a few degrees away from the North Star. Now, why is that? It's because of angular momentum. When the, when the solar system formed, it was spinning. There's just this big mush of interstellar gas and dust. And it was all spinning together. And eventually, little planets and asteroids formed, and comets, and the sun and down in the middle of it. But they were all spinning in the same way. If you were up um, halfway between Earth and, and uh, the North Star, and you looked back towards the Earth, you would see the solar system uh, circling in a counterclockwise manner. Almost everything. I, I should say almost all the planets, the asteroid belt, they all go counterclockwise. Now, comets don't do that. Uh, many comets do, but a lot of comets are just kind of random orbits uh, for various reasons. But angular momentum is the thing that helps you understand why this is still... If, if we were a billion years in the past, if we go into a time machine a billion years in the past to a place high on a mountain uh, in the southern hemisphere, we would see stars doing exactly the same thing. or pretty darn close to the same thing. Because the spin angular momentum of the Earth is conserved. It's a conserved quantity. Now to understand that, we want to first talk about the rotational analog of force, and that is leverage, or torque. Now here's a picture, very simple picture, of two blocks of stone, one of them being lifted by a lever, or about to be lifted by a lever, and the other one, the one in the middle, functioning as a fulcrum, or a pivot. And Archimedes, the great... Uh, mathematician figured out the law of leverage. He said, if you give me a lever long enough, I can move the entire earth if I can find a place to get leverage. And here's another example of leverage. Now look at this picture carefully. This is a teeter-totter. Seesaw. And Here's this little shrimpy little kid in front, and then his little sister. How do I know that's his little sister? Which one? How, what? What? In the, come on, CSI time. 
what in this picture tells you that she's littler than him? No, yeah, looks tinier, doesn't cut it. Yeah, he's down and she's up. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. Here, now, here's a, and these are both uh, images from your textbook. Here's another one. This little kid wins on the seesaw. He's down and she's up there stranded up there in the up there in the sky because he has more torque. His torque in this image he's over here on the left. And here's his weight force. W, the weight force of the sun. And then here's the girl's weight force, the weight force of the daughter. And here's her position R. And here's position P, the pivot point, or the fulcrum. Fulcrum point. Now, his torque, it, they're basically the same distance apart. If you go back and look at this image here, all right, they're basically, you can tell they're the same distance apart because they're both... They're both holding on to this little handle thing, and that's fixed in place. All right, so the same distance apart, same distance from the from the fulcrum point, so they're at equal positions. Segment LP here and segment PR, they're the same length, pretty much. But she has less weight force, so he's the one that causes it to spin. Now, if this if this teeter totter was not suspended on one point, but two points, you wouldn't get any spin. You just kind of sit there. Kind of like two sawhorses. You know, you balance a piece of plywood on two sawhorses, but if you try to balance it on one, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tip. Okay, same thing here. So if these two guys, so make a note of this. If these two guys had two suspension points or two supports, then the net force would be the sum of her weight force, W subscript D, and his weight force, W subscript S. And there wouldn't be any spin. All right? But the same force is acting, but only one support point, the fulcrum point, P, you get a spin. Now his spin is going to be... Uh, Let's see, that would be counterclockwise. Okay, so the little kid, the little boy, at point L, has counterclockwise torque. The girl, at point R, the little sister, has clockwise torque. If she were alone on the, on the teeter-totter, it would turn clockwise until she hit the ground. But this one... It turns counterclockwise until he hits the ground because he has more torque. So um, here's the idea of, let's, let's start talking about the ideas of torque. The amount of torque, torque is the rotational analog of force. Let's make a note of that first. And this is all from chapter 5 in your textbook. The rotational analog of torque, it depends on your position. So... So those guys have equally distant positions from the pivot point. But if, you know, things would change if one of them uh, moved in or moved out. Right? And that is discussed in the, in the textbook. It, also deter, it, it is also controlled by how many newtons that you can push or pull. In this case, the weight force is a pull force from the earth. Um, and so that also affects the net torque. So the little girl has some counterclock, some, excuse me, the little girl has clockwise torque, and, but not enough to overcome his counterclockwise torque. So they're like vectors. And you can read more about it in chapter five. Um, this device here that you see before you, a wrench, uh, is something that you use to put torque on a bolt. You tighten the bolt or you loosen the bolt, depending on which way you spin it. You spin it clockwise, it'll tighten. You spin it anti-clockwise, it'll loosen if it's a regular bolt. Here's another factor that you have to take into account, and this also is 
uh, a diagram from the textbook, a diagram that I created. This is a picture of someone pushing on a door. Now the hinge of the door is point H over here on the right. And the direction of push force one, so this is like somebody pushing with their fingertip uh, in that direction. Uh, that guy is going to get maximum torque because he's pushing perpendicular to the, to the door. Right? The direction at which you apply the force on the pivoting object makes a difference. For instance, this guy down here, this guy applying force F2 directly toward the hinge, he doesn't get jack. Zero torque from that baby. Now, if, if you read carefully in chapter uh, 5, you'll see a little bit more discussion. There's some Pythagorean theorem and some right triangles that you can mess around with in chapter, or that you can study, and that I've discussed very carefully um, related to this picture. The direction uh, at which you apply the force is also important in the idea of torque, the rotational analog to force. Now, a couple vocabulary terms I want to make sure you're squared away on, and they are these, translational and rotational. The first uh, little sub-diagram on the left, translational motion, that means from point A to point B, just on a straight line or something. And you, you might not be spinning. In a translational. So if I, if I push on the center of mass of something and it's not fixed at a fulcrum point, it's just free to move. If I, if I push at the center of mass, um, as described in the book, uh, it'll just go from point A to point B. I'll accelerate it, you know, a little F equals MA. So translational momentum or linear momentum is a term that you want to attached to this basic term. So translational momentum and linear momentum are both mentioned in your e-text. It means point A to point B, directional. Now, if something is spinning or rotating, uh, you don't really say that it's not really going from point A to point B. It's just kind of spinning its wheels. It's not, it's moving, but it's not going anywhere. All right. And so that, that would be pure rotational motion. Okay, so it, we would say it rotates about a fixed point. And so the Earth, now the Earth actually combines both motions because it's moving in space around the sun, but it's also spinning on its axis. So the Earth has a fairly complex motion. Um, and if you, if you were to think of, you know, then there's this compound motion or combination motion over here on the right. Uh, that's... You know, this is a stick or a ruler, and if you throw a ruler from the end and you just throw it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rotate, and it's also going to arc through the air, which is what they've tried to uh, show you in this diagram. For us, the word rotational motion, the other um, uh, adjective is angular. Okay, so we don't usually say rotational momentum. We usually say angular momentum, but we say rotational motion. Something can have an angular velocity. Uh, we don't usually say rotational uh, velocity. Let's talk about that. Uh, so the rotational analog to F equals MA is torque equals I times alpha. And what is I? That is the moment of inertia. Capital I is the uh, rotational analog to force. And you will read about that in chapter 5 in, in your homework, your reading assignment tonight. Um, alpha, tau equals I alpha. Alpha is the rotational acceleration. In other words, how fast are the RPMs speeding up? How fast are the RPMs slowing down? I mean, it's, you know, are you, are you juicing it up to higher RPMs? Or you, you know, giving it a little bit of friction to slow it down. Now that's what alpha 
Now, regular force changes the momentum state. We've talked about this at length. Net force equals delta P over delta T. That's one way of expressing um, uh, Newton's second law in terms of the change of the momentum. Now, that is the translational momentum or the linear momentum. So it is logical to, to surmise or to conjecture that something else is some momentum-like quantity is also changed per unit time by a torque, by leverage. Okay, And if you've ever played on one of those, I don't know if they still have them, but when I was a kid, they had these merry-go-rounds at the, at the, at the uh, uh, playground, you know, at the park. And, you know, maybe about as wide as, wide as this lectern up here, so maybe 10 feet wide, and a bunch of rails, and it's on a, a central axis, and you can spin it around and stuff. And you can, if you go fast enough, you get dizzy and stuff like that. Raise your hand if you, if you played on something like that when you were a little kid. Okay, I guess they still have them around. Probably, they, they're probably trying to get rid of them because they're pretty dangerous. Anyways, so, so if, you, if you remember back to the days or if you've ever seen somebody on one of those little merry-go-rounds, you know, it takes a second to get it spun up to, to you know, so many RPMs where you really feel like you're, you're, you're flying and stuff. Okay? And so that's, what we're, that's kind of what we're thinking about. The quantity that is the answer to this question... Uh, what kind of rotational analog to momentum is changed by a torque? Uh, the answer to that question is angular momentum. And that is what we're going to study for the next few minutes. And then, as a matter of fact, there's two kinds of angular momentum. The first kind is orbital angular momentum. And that is the momentum that an object has um, with respect to a certain point if it's going on any curved path. And so, uh, so the Earth going around the Sun, you can the Earth's path around the Sun is slightly elliptical, but it's actually very very close to a perfect circle. So we could round it off to a perfect circle. And on a perfect circle, you have the Sun at the very center. Okay, and so we would say that Earth has orbital angular momentum about the Sun. Spin angular momentum. Okay, if an object is also spinning like a top or spinning like Earth itself, then yeah, that also counts as angular momentum because um, if you just think about the Earth for a second, um, the, you know, South America is rotating uh, to the east and Asia is rotating to the east and Europe is rotating and Africa is rotating to the east. Uh, Let's see, 15 degrees per hour, 20, 360 degrees every day. Right? That's the angular velocity of Earth. And so that is, uh, you would encode the angular momentum of Earth uh, because it, in addition to its orbital, you would encode spin angular momentum. All right? Now, the example of that is this is this kind of a cylindrical, kind of like a millstone or a grindstone that you may have in your shop, you know, going at certain RPM, 600 RPM, 600 revolutions per minute. That's 10 per second, 10, 10 spins per second. And it's not really going anywhere, but it's spinning. And so that counts for a, a lot of orbital, a lot of angular momentum. So let's get down to details, orbital angular momentum. Okay, so there's got to be some fixed point of interest, i.e. the sun, or e.g. the sun. And so here's a, here's a diagram. And over here in the, the lower right corner, this little circle down here, that's the Earth. And this is, I've drawn in a line segment to symbolize the position. Now that's a hundred and, uh, or that's 93 million miles. 150 
million kilometers, 500 light seconds of distance from the sun to the earth. So this is kind of exaggerated. It's not to scale. But then this bigger circle here, this colored circle, this greenish circle, uh, is, stands for the SUN. And this dotted line circle stands for the orbit of Earth uh, around the sun. All right now, you can also have something like a comet. Comets go on any, any kind of an orbit. A lot of the ones that we see um, that come periodically here to Earth are on elliptical orbits like this one. And you could do a similar position uh, line segment from the sun out to the comet. But I've just drawn this one in from the sun out to Earth because I don't want to clutter up my diagram. But everything that we do with Earth and the sun, you could easily do uh, with a little bit of trig and a little bit of calculus, you could do also on an elliptical orbit. But a circular orbit like Earth's is pretty easy to handle. So the distance and the angle uh, from that point, that central point, out to the planet or comet is uh, important for, for knowing the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum. It also applies to an electron. So we would say that an electron in an orbital state around the nucleus of an atom also has orbital angular momentum because they, we, we think or we say that the planet, the ellipse, or excuse me, the planet, the comet, or the electron have a velocity. They're in motion around the sun or, in the case of an atom, around the nucleus of the atom. Now, go ahead and draw in a velocity vector here for Earth, which I've done, this little V vector down here, uh, to symbolize, for this simple example, the Earth on a circular orbit, um, that's the counterclockwise motion. So this is from the perspective north of the solar system. And again, as I, I mentioned, if you were to go, um, you know, halfway or even a quarter of the way to the North Star and look back at the Earth, you'd see all the planets going uh, on counterclockwise orbits. Now the comets don't all, all go that because they're affected by Jupiter and Saturn and stuff, sometimes even by Earth. Uh, so they don't always have the same counterclockwise motion. But the planets and the, and the sun as well uh, have uh, counterclockwise motion. Very simple formula for the orbital angular momentum. Here's the formula for it. Capital L is the traditional symbol for orbital angular momentum. So if something's orbiting a planet, orbiting a star, a moon orbiting a planet, an electron orbiting a nucleus, uh, then it has angular momentum and it, it has to have mass, m, it has to be away from the center, r, and it has to have some speed, v. On a circular orbit, this is the formula. And make a side note, um, for this formula, this is the formula for circular orbits. For something like an elliptical comet orbit, you'd have to do a bunch of trig and stuff like that. You could do it, but it's, it's kind of tricky. We're not going to focus too much on ellipses. But yeah, definitely circular orbits like Earth's. Now, for something that is spinning, things are a little bit different. Right? So spin angular momentum. And, and he, here I, I come back to this diagram of this uh, grindstone uh, moving 600 RPM. Uh, in this picture, it's moving clockwise. Is that clockwise? Yeah, clockwise. Okay. okay. And, and basically, the spin angular momentum, it's not going anywhere around the solar system. It's just got a fixed axle. So this is the object that is behind itself. Um, but it, it has a, a, a huge number of or, orbital angular momentum. And uh, I have a typo here. It says for a rigid object, all those all those little pixels of mass. If you if you pixelate this grindstone into little little pixels of mass, you know a few molecules or a few grams of mass, you know depending on how you want to account for it, they all have the same angular velocity. So cross out the word frequency here 
I caught this in first hour, but I forgot to change it. So that for a rigid object, every pixel of mass, every little element of mass has the same angular velocity. In other words, they're all going at 600 RPM. Now, there are different distances, there are, and so make a note of that. They all have different R's, all right? You know, so every gram of material in this grindstone, they're all, every gram is going 600 RPM. But there's a bunch of grams at, you know, 2 centimeters, say, and then there's more grams at 2.1 centimeters and more grams at 2.2, and more grams at 2.3, and on out to the edge of this, this wheel. So every, uh, every mass is not equivalent, but they all add up. And the way that they add up is uh, in terms of something called the moment of inertia, which you will read about in the homework tonight. Moment of inertia, capital I, is the rotational analog of mass, capital I. But like the rotational analog of momentum and the rotational analog of force, the rotational analog of mass doesn't involve R, it involves R squared. So the distance away from the axis of spin and then square it, R squared. That is what goes into the, the moment of inertia. And it is the rotational analog of mass. Now, this formula for L, angular momentum L, this is spin angular momentum. And I want you to look at it carefully. Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity. And that is completely analogous to P equals MV. P equals MV, go ahead and write that down over to the side or something. P equals MV, that is the translational momentum formula. P is the translational momentum. M is mass and V is the velocity. Okay, in this this angular momentum formula, L is angular momentum, not P, but angular momentum. I is not mass. It's the rotational analog of mass, the, the moment of inertia. And omega, this, this kind of curvaceous W, that's lowercase Greek omega. That's not velocity, like P equals mv. Omega is angular velocity. In this case, you would, and matter of fact, go ahead and make a note. In this case, you'd be drawing a, a vector for the angular velocity along the axis behind the grindstone. So it'd, go, it'd be going like that. It'd be going into the paper, kind of off, into the paper and off to the, to the right. Now, the exception to this spin angular momentum thing is the electron. We don't, we think that electrons behave as if they have spin, but we can't really see them spinning. We've never been able to measure it. We don't think they're actually spinning, but they, and matter of fact, an electron has a quantum of angular momentum. And the quantum of angular momentum is uh, pretty important. And we don't, so we don't really, you know, a, a grindstone like this, yeah, we can see it's spinning, it's got an axis and all that stuff, but we can't really see that for an electron. My electrons are so small, we can't really find a structure to an electron. We don't know its radius. You know, we can estimate it and stuff, but we don't really, we don't think it has a, it just, it's not like a little billiard ball, it's like a it's like an electron, that's all I can say. And it has angular momentum. It behaves as if it has angular momentum. Matter of fact, go ahead and make a side note here. Magnetism, you know, your refrigerator magnet, your bar magnet, your compass, 
works because of angular momentum of electrons. Iron has a very special uh, angular momentum state and it can be magnetized. And there are other elements that can be magnetized. Some can't be magnetized, you know, like hydrogen. I mean, but we can always measure the magnetic effects of, of electrons. It's just that iron, they're very, very prominent effects, the way iron is stacked up. Photons, the basic particle of light. The object that, when it hits your retina, jiggles a special molecule in your retina called retinal. And when it hits that molecule, it makes the molecule bend. And when that bend hits the molecule, it fires your optic nerve. And it tells your brain, you just got a little photon of light. And your brain is able to interpret. Think of how complex it could you, Think about it. Every single person that you see, their face, you understand what a face is, and you can tell faces apart. Think if you had to paint a face one pixel at a time. But your, your, your brain can analyze all those individual photons coming into your retina every second as a face. It's amazing. And photons have spin, and we don't understand those either. I mean, we know that they have spin, but why a photon has spin, it's, you know, it's kind of mysterious. Things in the universe seem to have intrinsic spin. Okay, here's another picture of omega. This one, omega is going, now, omega in this picture is going uh, anti-clockwise. So for this omega, you guys, the angular uh, velocity vector would be pointing out of the plane. All right. And one thing I want to emphasize to you is that on a rigid body, every point has the same angular velocity. It's got a different R away from the axle. But they're all going at 600 RPM or whatever the angular velocity is. So um, they may have the same rotational velocity or angular velocity, but the V, the actual meters per second, the speedometer, would be different. If, you're at, if everything's at 600 RPM and you're near the center, the spin axis, your speedometer is not very high. But if you're way out there at the edge of the grindstone, you got a lot of R, and 600 RPM, you're whipping. Your speedometers read pretty high. Now, your homework assignment is to tackle 7.1 and definitely read through chapter 5.5. It's 110. I am now dismissing early. See you on Thursday. Can I?